mourning and weeping. I felt, okay, this is the end. We are finished. I thought we wouldn't be able to carry on without Kim Il-sung. The new leader of North Korea, Kim Jong-il, lacks his father's charismatic command. Many predict that his government will soon collapse, but he is determined to retain power at any cost. This is a man for whom regime survival is fundamental. And so he will do what he needs to do to stay in power in terms of the control over his people, the lack of human rights, and some of those things are quite horrific. The national security system has been strengthened under Kim Jong-il. The political surveillance expanded. In the past, people were taken away, imprisoned with discretion, but now they just don't care. They openly pick up people and then put them in prison, and they disappear without leaving a trace. Many disappear into a system of prison camps, hidden between the mountains near the northern border. The only known photographs of the prisons themselves are satellite pictures. These sketches were drawn by former prison guard An Myung Cha. I was a prison guard for eight years, and I saw brutal stuff. Think of Auschwitz during World War II. In Auschwitz, they specialized in killing people fast. In North Korea, they kill them as slowly as possible. They told me that the inmates were political criminals and disloyal. So if they attempted to escape, we could shoot them to death. In 1994, An learns that his father has been overheard criticizing Kim Il-sung. He knows he will have to escape North Korea or face dire consequences. I had done nothing wrong. My father was branded as a traitor, and then he was killed. My mother was also accused of being a traitor and put in prison. My brother was killed too. So I had to escape somehow, even if that meant death. The Duman River marks the border between North Korea and China. It is patrolled by North Korean agents who often shoot to kill people trying to escape. After several attempts, An makes it safely to the other side. Others are not so fortunate. Despite the risks, by the mid-90s, an increasing number of people attempt to flee North Korea, not only because of the growing repression, but primarily because of the country's ever-deepening economic crisis. They're in economic trouble, partly because they don't run their economy very well, but by the mid-90s, you then have a series of natural disasters, floods, etc., that lead to serious famine. But these tragic conditions do not deter Kim from extravagant spending on his vast military forces. He starves his people at the expense of providing for his military. 30 to 50 percent of the North Korean gross domestic product goes to the military. In 1998, North Korea launched a rocket over Japan it created a huge outcry, not only because it went over Japan, but because, unbeknownst to our analysts in advance, it turned out to be a three-stage rocket. If that three-stage rocket had been successful, which it was not, it uh, fell into the sea, uh, it very soon could have reached the continental United States. The White House is stunned. The hope for a peaceful progression in relations has collapsed on both sides. When North Korea made its nuclear freeze agreement with the U.S. in 1994, we got up front what we wanted. They stopped their nuclear program that could have made 30 nuclear weapons a year in a very short time if it had not been stopped. So they felt they'd given up quite a lot. They got promises. 
After this agreement was concluded in 1994, the Republicans take over Congress. Clinton faces real opposition to this agreement he just concluded. You softy, you've just given away the store to North Korea. So Clinton just didn't carry out most of this agreement. And many people in the Clinton administration thought, well, North Korea will collapse anyway. We don't have to carry it out. In the meanwhile, the military men in North Korea are going to Kim Jong-il and saying, you sucker, you've been conned. When Kim launches his long-range missile, Clinton is compelled to rethink U.S. policy towards North Korea. Following South Korea's lead of dialogue with the North, in October 2000, the president sends his secretary of state, Madeleine Albright, to Pyongyang for direct talks with Kim Jong-il. Well, I went, having been briefed on what kind of a weirdo he was from our own people. He was portrayed as reclusive-like, uh, with many girlfriends and uh, watching porno movies, and basically a very weird kind of a person that you had no idea what he was going to be like. He was actually quite charming. While I knew all the terrible things that he had done, I could at least make the distinction that he wasn't crazy. He was very, very well prepared, responded without notes, was not only uh, respectful, but also interested in what I had to say. The talks with Secretary Albright lead to a remarkable breakthrough. Kim Jong-il puts his missile program on the table. He offers to end all exports of ballistic missiles. He offers to freeze the production, deployment, and testing of all ballistic missiles with a range of 300 miles or more. This was extraordinary. It was indeed a moment of great hope. There was a possibility Kim Jong-il was finally going to enter the community of nations, perhaps hesitantly, but ultimately uh, to really create the final peace and stability that might replace the armistice of 50 years that had been put in place at the end of the Korean War. It was a hopeful set of cards that we left on the table. I think it was a big surprise to everybody when the Bush administration decided not to pick up that hand of cards. The newly elected President Bush has grave concerns that Kim Jong-il cannot be trusted. North Korea is a regime arming with missiles and weapons of mass destruction. States like these and their terrorist allies constitute an axis of evil. Bush's strong words are met by an increasingly defiant Kim Jong-il. North Korea's seeming determination to become a nuclear power will lead to an ever-escalating confrontation with the United States. Fearing that he too will be targeted by precision-guided missiles, like those used against Saddam Hussein, Kim Jong-il goes into hiding for 50 days, shortly before the U.S. invasion of Iraq. Kim's disappearance also coincides with the annual U.S.-South Korean joint military exercises. For more than 50 years, the U.S. military has maintained a commitment to protect the South at a cost of more than $2 billion per year. 37,000 American troops are still in place and ready for combat. If I were North Koreans, I would worry too. We know today the Americans have a five-stage attack plan uh, on North Korea. They are scared of us. They've been scared of us throughout the Cold War. And now during the Bush period, they've become really scared again. People say, well, are you willing to talk to North Korea? Of course we are. But what this nation won't do is be blackmailed. President Bush has stated that any direct talks prior to North Korea's halting of its nuclear program are blackmail, the rewarding of bad behavior. If that remains the U.S. posture, I think we're headed for a train wreck. I think it will be very difficult 
to prevent North Korea from going ahead with a nuclear weapons program. But many believe that Kim's true intention is to bargain away his nuclear program in exchange for normal relations with the West and a guarantee his regime will survive. Deep down, the honest feeling on the part of top leadership, in my assessment, is that they like to have a situation where they don't need to pursue nuclear weapons. I'm absolutely sure if we provide a security assurance, they will have incentive to do away with their nuclear programs. In April 2003, U.S. and North Korean officials meet in China to try to resolve the nuclear issue. The meeting ends badly, cut short when North Korea announces that they now possess atomic weapons. Though still unverified, the assertion adds new urgency to the debate within the Bush administration on how to proceed. There are no easy options. The administration has not yet figured out what they're going to do about North Korea. If we're going to try to talk North Korea out of nuclear weapons, we have to be able to say, if you satisfy us on the nuclear weapons issue, we will otherwise leave you alone. That might not work, but that has to be phase one. If that doesn't work, then we need to move on to uh, 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 other options, including the military option, which we shouldn't take off the table. Stakes are too high. This is too serious a matter. We have to be able to risk war. Short of war, a naval blockade of all goods entering and leaving North Korea is being considered. But the risks are enormous, especially to South Korea, which remains extremely vulnerable. In May 2003, North Korean officials stated, the South will sustain an unspeakable disaster if it turns to confrontation. Ironically, the new president of South Korea, No Mu Hyun, is less worried about threats from Kim Jong-il than the possibility that the Bush government's hawkish policies will trigger a military strike by North Korea. President No was elected on a platform of engagement and cooperation with the North and eventual reunification. Kim Jong-il has stated that he too shares the goal of a reunified Korea. The question is, under what terms? A totalitarian socialist regime ruled by Kim? Those with ties to North Korea's leaders deny that that's Kim's intention. The North Korean idea of reunification is not a socialist system. People think that Kim Jong-un is a socialist first. He's a national first. Yeah. His first priority is survival of the Korean nation as one nation. Yeah. That means the North and the South Korea coming together under the umbrella of confederation. Political economic system are kept intact. But for all his promising assurances, Kim has proved to be difficult to trust. His violation of agreements in the past has led to profound doubts about his true ambitions, and not only by the Bush administration. Many South Koreans are equally skeptical. Their pain-filled memories of the last time North Korea attempted to reunify the nation are deeply felt. I always say the Korean unification will not come until the Korean War generations all die. Because it was a fratricidal war. Brothers killing brothers, families killing families. Reconciliation of these people is not easy. The Korean Peninsula will be reunified someday, long after I'm gone. I think the best way is the solution by the Almighty that the South Korean people who remember the war, they should.